Next Sutta 3.6 Sabya Sutta. Thus have I heard. Once the Buddha was staying in the bamboo grove by the squirrels feeding ground at Rajagaha. Now at about this time, a wandering holy man was visited by a deva. The wondrous name was Sabya, and this deva had, in an earlier life, been a relative of his. The deva taught Sabya a list of questions that he should put to any holy man he met. If you find any Brahmin or recluse who can answer them, then, said the deva, you should take that man as your teacher and commit yourself to a life of purity with him. So Sabya, the wanderer, learned the questions by heart and set off to find all the great religious leaders of the time, all the famous teachers who had their own groups of followers and monks. He saw successively Purana Kasapa, Makali Gosala, Ajita Kesa Kambali, Pakuda Kachayana, Sanjaya Belati Putta, and the Jain teacher Nata Putta or Mahavira. But none of them could answer his questions. Indeed, all of them got angry or uneasy when they saw that they had failed and started asking Sabya questions in return. And Sabya thought, I might as well give up and go back to easy living and a life of pleasure. But then he thought of something else. There was one other holy man famous for his teaching and the number of his followers, a young man named Gotama. Why not ask him? But he, thought Sabia, is very young and has not been a holy man for long. How could he know more than the other older teachers I have seen? Another thought occurred to Sabia. A holy man should be respected for his power and his dignity, not for his age. So he decided, after all, to go and see the holy man Gotama. Off he went on his pilgrimage, until one day he came to Rajagaha. There, in the bamboo grove, by the squirrel's feeding ground, he found the master. He greeted him politely, paid his respects, and after sitting down to one side, he spoke in verse to the master. I have come to you, said Sabia, full of confusion and doubt. I so much want to have these questions answered. Please settle them for me once and for all, and explain each answer to me one by one. And the Buddha said, You have come a long way, Sabya, with these questions that you so much want to have answered. I will settle them for you once and for all, and explain each answer to you one by one. Ask me whatever you want, Sabya, and I will explain it and clear up your confusion. Sabya thought, it's amazing, it is surprising. Other recluses and Brahmins do not even permit me to raise the questions. But the ascetic Gautama has at last permitted me to raise them. He was glad, elated and encouraged. And so he questioned the Buddha. What master must you do to be called a monk? What does it mean to be gentle? What is the meaning of restraint? And what does it mean to be a Buddha, to be enlightened? Please explain these four things to me, Master. And this is what the Buddha said. A monk, Sabya, is a person who has created a path for himself by which he has attained complete tranquility, overcoming doubt. He, having abandoned being and non-being, has perfected the religious life and has destroyed re-becoming. He is constantly equanimous, and mindful. He does not harm anyone anywhere. A recluse is one who has crossed over to Nibbana. He is unconfused. He has no evil traits. Such a one is gentle. He has crossed the ocean of samsara. He whose senses are cultivated in connection with the whole world, both internal and external, with penetrative understanding of this and the other world. The cultivated and restrained person awaits with equanimity the time of death. He who has scrutinized the entirety of thoughts and cyclic existence, consisting of both birth and death, the dustless, stainless, pure one, who has attained the destruction of birth, is called the Buddha. Sabya was thrilled to hear these words and went on to ask another set of questions. What do you have to do to be a Brahmana? What does it mean to renounce, to be a holy man, a samana? What does it mean to be cleansed? And who can be called a hero? 
please explain these things to me, Master. And so the Master replied, A Brahmana is a person who, having avoided all evil, is stainless, good, composed and poised, overcoming the cycle of existence. He has become perfect. He is unattached and steadfast. A holy man is a man who has calmed himself, is a man who has abandoned merit and demerit. Knowing this world and the other, he is dustless and has overcome birth and death, washing away all evil connected with the whole world, both inner and outer, and with regard to men and gods, he does not engage in conceptual thought. He is called the cleansed, someone who lives in the world without doing wrong, someone who has untied all ties and chains, someone who does not hang on to anything anywhere, who is released, is called a steadfast hero. Sabya, thrilled with these answers, went on to ask more questions. Who do enlightened men consider to be a world winner? What does it mean to be skilled? What does it mean to be a man of understanding? And who is entitled to be called a wise man? Please, Master, explain these things to me. And the Master answered, You ask what a world winner is. There are three worlds, the world of men, the world of gods, and the world of Brahma beings. A world winner examines and understands all three. He has pulled up by the roots his links to these worlds, and he is free. This is a state called world winner. You ask what skill is. There are three kinds of treasures or stores, those stocked by men, those stocked by gods, and those stocked by Brahma beings. The man of skill examines and understands all three. He has pulled up by the roots his links to these stocks, and he is free. This is the state called skill. A man of understanding is a man who has looked at his senses. He has understood how the senses work both in the mind and in the outside world. He sees with clarity. He has gone beyond black and white and is steadfast. And a man of wisdom, a wise man knows the way of distinguishing good from bad in connection with both the inner and the outer world. Both gods and men respect him. He has broken the chains and ropes. Sabya, thrilled with these answers, went on to ask another set of questions. What do you have to achieve to be a man of knowledge? By what does one become an, an insightful person? How does one become an energetic man? And what does thoroughbred mean? Please explain these things to me, Master. And the Master of the Buddha said, When a man has looked at knowledge and understood all that is known to recluses and Brahmins, then all the longings and yearnings for sensations disappear. Going beyond all knowledge, he is a man of knowledge. Understanding the obsession of Nama Rupa, mentality and materiality, the root of the disease, both internal and external, he is free from the ties to all roots of disease. Due to this reason, he is called a steadfast, insightful person. Here he is free from all evil and has overcome the misery of hell. Hence he is energetic. He is zealous, energetic, steadfast. You ask about the thoroughbred, the man of high birth. The thoroughbred snaps chains. There are internal and external chains with ropes and bonds. Nobility means breaking them. It means pulling them up at the roots and being freed. This is the state called thoroughbred. Sabya, thrilled with these answers and full of joy, asked the master another set of questions. What do you have to do to be a man of learning? What does it mean to be an Arya, a man of noble birth? What is a man of perfect action and who is entitled to the name of wanderer? Please, Master, explain these things to me. So the Master told him, Having listened to all views, he knows with wisdom whatever is blameworthy and blameless. He is victorious, freed and beyond confusion, and disturbance. He is a man of learning. The wise one has cut off asavas and attachments. He does not go into lying in a womb. He has got rid of the three drives, greed, hatred, and delusion. 
and he does not enter into the mud of conceptual thinking. He is called the man of noble birth. Because a man of perfect action has lived and done correctly, and with skill he grasps the way things are, he has no attachment anywhere. He is freed. He has no built-in aversions. This is perfect action. And you ask about the wanderer. When you see which actions hurt, and when you leave those actions and are not in those actions, or above or below or beyond or between or anywhere near those actions, then you are a wanderer. When you move from place to place and never lose your power to understand, then you are a wanderer. When you lose your hating, wanting, delusion and pride, and when you end your sense of psychophysical individuality, then you have won success and then you are a wanderer. Sabya, the wanderer, was thrilled at the master's words. Full of joy and delight, he got up from his seat and with his hands folded and his shoulders bare, he spoke to the master in verse. Master, wise one, he said, you have done away with the traditional 63 argumentative theses, the conclusions of recluses, which are mere conventions and speculative ideas. You have crossed over the flood and reached its end. You have gone to the very furthest point of suffering, and then you have gone beyond it. You, Master, are a man of worth. For you, I think, there are no more inner drives. You are glowing with understanding, radiating wisdom, finish suffering and carrying me across. You saw what I was looking for. You knew what I was unsure of, and you carried me across. What mastery, what heights. This is the ultimate in wisdom. I can give nothing but respect, nothing but honor to this powerhouse of gentleness, this brother of the sun. You have cleared up all my doubts with the eye of your perfect vision. So this wisdom, this is full enlightenment. This is what it's like to have nothing in your way. All worries are gone, disturbances cut out, and instead you have all that is calm, controlled, firm and precise. When you speak, the gods celebrate. When they hear you, they rejoice. You are a hero amongst heroes and a power amongst the strong. Nowhere in this world is there anyone like you. You are the best and the noblest being. I salute you and I honor you. You are the Buddha, the enlightened. You are the master, the teacher. You are the Mara conquering wisdom. You have cut out inner bias, inner weighing, and you have crossed over and you are taking us, all of us, with you. With the rebirth factors ended and the drives destroyed, you are at the end of clinging. You are a lion in the jungle with nothing to frighten and nothing to fear. It's like a lotus flower on a lake. Good and evil roll off you, ineffective, like water drops off a lotus petal. Let me honor the feet of a conqueror. I am Sabia the worshipper at the feet of his teacher. And so Sabya, the wanderer, bent down in respect at the feet of the Buddha and said, This is amazing, Venerable Gautama. This wonderful, Venerable Gautama. Just as if one might raise what has been overturned or reveal what has been hidden or point out the way to him who has gone astray or hold out a lamp in the dark so that those who have eyes may see objects. So likewise has the truth been explained by Venerable Gautama in various ways. Therefore, I take refuge in him, his Dhamma and his Sangha. I wish to enter the homeless life and to receive the high ordination near the Venerable Gautama. Then Sabya, the wanderer, received ordination as a novice and received the high ordination near the Buddha. Later, by leading a secluded life, diligently, energetically and with a resolute will, in a short time, he understood, experienced and attained that highest perfection of a noble life for which the sons of good families leave the household life harmoniously and take to the life of homelessness. Rebirth had been ended, a noble life had been led, what was to be done had been done and there was nothing else to be done in this earthly existence. Sabya the wanderer had become one of the Arahans. Ah, oh, this Sabya got a lot of questions. Huh?
นกสุตตา is three point seven เซลาสุตตา this also found in the Majjhima Nikaya สุตตา number ninety two ละ so this is quite long also thus have I heard once the Buddha was travelling in the company of over one thousand two hundred fifty monks and reached a market town called Apana in Anguttarapa an ascetic with matted hair called Kenya heard thus That the venerable Gotama, a descendant of the Sakin clan, who had renounced his family, had arrived at Apana, and he also heard these words of praise: "That blessed one is such, since he is accomplished, fully enlightened, endowed with wisdom and conduct, sublime, knower of worlds, incomparable leader of men to be tamed, teacher of gods and men, enlightened and glorious." He himself, having realized the truth, Makes it known to the world of men and gods, including ascetics and Brahmins. He teaches the truth, which is good in the beginning, in the middle, and at the end, full of meaning, rich in words, and wholly complete. He teaches a perfect, pure life. Good indeed is the sight of such saints. Then the ascetic Kenya went to see the Buddha, and after exchanging greetings, sat on one side. The Buddha made him very happy with the discourse. Whereupon Kenya invited the Buddha, together with his retinue of monks, for lunch on the following day. However, the Buddha warned him of the large number of monks in his company and alluded to Kenya's close friendship with the Brahmins. Undeterred, Kenya persisted with his invitation, and on the third occasion of asking, the Buddha assented to his request by keeping silent. Thereupon Kenya returned to his hermitage. And solicited the assistance of his friends, servants, and relations to help arrange the alms giving. They all worked in various capacities. Kenya himself erected a circular pavilion. Stop here for a moment, na. So when this Kenya invited the Buddha, the Buddha gave him two warnings, lah. One is that, na, the Sangha with him, ma, is more than a thousand monks, ah. So not easy to、uh, make an offering. The second one. He said, "Na, that he is、uh, uh, very close to the Brahmins, lah. He he has a lot of Brahmin friends.、So、why the Buddha mentioned this? Because a lot of the Brahmins don't like the Buddha,、uh, don't like the Buddha. So since he has a lot of Brahmin friends, ah,、uh, it must jeopardize his、uh, friendship with the Brahmins, lah. But still, he he pleaded with the Buddha three times, and the Buddha accepted, lah. At that time, a Brahmin called Sela lived in Apana." He was well versed in the three Vedas: vocabulary, prosody, rhetoric, etymology, history. Versed in meter, grammarian, one not deficient in popular controversy and the science of his yognomi. He taught three hundred young men. Since he was on friendly terms with Kenya, he visited his hermitage along with his pupils. Seeing the brisk preparations going on there, he remarked to Kenya, "Will there be a marriage of a son or daughter?" Is a great sacrifice about to take place? Or has King Bimbisara of Magadha been invited for lunch tomorrow, together with his large army? And Kenya replied, "Nothing of that kind is going on here. Yet a great sacrifice of mine is approaching. The ascetic Gotama, the the Buddha, with his disciples, has been invited for lunch tomorrow." And Sela said, "Do you say that he is a Buddha?" "Yes, I do," said Kenya. Then this thought occurred to Sela: the word Buddha is indeed rare, but in our Vedas, the thirty-two signs of a great man are found. There are there are but two conditions to such a person, and none other. If he leads a household life, he will become a king, an emperor, a just ruler. If, however, he renounces the household for the homeless life, he will become a saint, a fully enlightened one, Samasam Buddha. One who has removed the covering of the asavas, and he asked, "O、oh, Kenya, where does the Buddha dwell now?" And Kenya replied, "Where, O、oh, Sela, lies the forest belt?" Then Sela, together with his three hundred disciples, approached the Buddha, and noticing the signs of a great man on his body, praised him in a suitable verse: "O、oh, Buddha, you have a perfect body; you are resplendent." Well-born, handsome, of golden color, 
you have white teeth and you are energetic. If there be any signs of a man who is well born, all those signs of a great man are on your body. You have bright eyes, a handsome countenance. You are great, straight, majestic. You shine like the sun in the midst of the assembly of monks. You are a monk of lovely appearance. You have a skin like gold. What advantage can there be in being an ascetic when you are possessed of such a splendid complexion? You deserve to be a king, an emperor, the lord of chariots, whose conquests reach to the limits of the four seas, lord of the Jambu Grove, that is India. Warrior and healthy kings are devoted to you, O Gotama. Exercise your royal power as a king of kings, a chief of men. And the Buddha said, I am a king, O Sela, supreme king of the teaching of Dhamma. I turn the wheel by pure means. This wheel is irresistible. And Sela said, You maintain that you are a fully enlightened one, a king of Dhamma. O Gotama, you say, I turn the wheel by pure means. Who is your general? Who is your disciple? Who is the follower of the teacher? Who hereafter will turn the wheel of Dhamma turned by you? And the Buddha said, Sela, Sariputta will hereafter turn the incomparable wheel of Dhamma turned by me. He walks after the Tathagata. Or, uh, he's just like the Tathagata. He teaches just like him. What is to be known is known by me. What is to be cultivated is cultivated by me. What is to be destroyed has been destroyed by me. Therefore, Brahmin, I am the Buddha. Brahm, Brahmin, subdue your doubts about me. Have confidence in me. Rare is it to obtain the sight of a fully enlightened one. O Brahmin, of those whose manifestation is rare for you to see, I am a representative, an incomparable physician, preeminent, matchless, the vanquisher of Mara and his army. Having brought under subjection all enemies, I rejoice, secure from all directions. And Sela said, O oh friends, pay attention to what the seeing one says. He is a physician, a great hero, and roars like a lion in the forest. Having seen him, preeminent, matchless, the vanquisher of Mara and his army, who cannot be overcome, even if he be of black origin. He who wishes, let him follow me. He who does not wish, let him go away, for I shall now enter the Sangha under the excellent wise one. And the followers of Sela said, If the dispensation of the fully enlightened one pleases you, we shall also enter the Sangha under the excellent wise one. So the, and the Sela said, These three hundred Brahmins with clasped hands state, We will practice the pure life under the accomplished one. And the Buddha said, Sela, the pure life is well proclaimed by me, visible here and now, affording result without delay. It is not in vain that one may become a monk, whereby one may train himself diligently. Then the Brahmin Sela, together with his assembly of three hundred, uh, entered the Sangha and received the higher ordination under the Buddha. Meanwhile, the ascetic Kenya informed the Buddha that lunch was ready. Consequently, he went to Kenya's hermitage together with his assembly of monks where they were served with sumptuous food. On completion of the meal, the Buddha delighted Kenya with these words, The principal item in the sacrifice is fire. The principal figure in the hymns is Savitri. The king is the principal amongst men, and amongst rivers the sea is principal. Amongst the planets the moon is the principal or the chief la. Amongst burning objects, the sun is principal. Amongst those who make offerings, wishing for merit, the Sangha of monks is indeed principal. Then the Buddha, having delighted Kenya with these verses, went away. Then the Venerable Sela, together with his assembly, retired to a solitary place and led such a strenuous, ardent and energetic existence that within a short time, in this present life, by his own understanding, ascertained and possessed himself of that highest perfection of a pure life, for the sake of which men of good family renounce their home for homelessness. Becoming was destroyed. A pure life had been led. What had to be done was done. 
and there was nothing else to be done in this existence. Thus the Venerable Sela, together with his assembly, became Arahants. Uh, this, uh, although it says in, within a short time, uh, probably it took several years la, or ten years or more. La. Thereafter, they went to the Buddha and after making salutation, addressed him in verse. On the, eh, eh, this is very fast. On the eighth day previous to this, we took refuge in you. O oh, Venerable Sir, within seven nights we were trained in your dispensation. You are the Buddha, you are the teacher. You are the Muni who conquered Mara. After cutting off latent inclinations, you crossed over the stream of existence and took over these beings to the other shore. The objects of attachment have been overcome by you. The influxes have been destroyed by you. You are a lion not seizing on clinging. You have left behind fear and terror. These three hundred monks stand here with clasped hands, O hero. Stretch out your feet and let the Nagas worship the teacher's feet. That means they attain enlightenment uh, after seven nights. Uh, this is uh, uh, quite unusual. Uh. It shows uh, they had probably already attained uh, jhana before they became the Buddha's disciples. Uh. This is uh, Indian tradition. Uh, they uh, value the holy life. Uh, so... And they meet somebody they think is a holy man, uh, they easily renounce. Uh. Next sutta is 3.8, Sala Sutta. Life is unpredictable. This is a reflection on death. Uh. Life is unpredictable and uncertain in this world. Life here is difficult, short and bound up with suffering. A being once born is going to die and there is no way out of this. An old age arrives or some other cause, then there is death. This is the way it is with living beings. When fruits become ripe, they may fall in the early morning. In just the same way, a being once born may die at any moment. Stop here for a moment. Huh? Fall in the early morning means huh? a person huh? uh, very early in life huh? passes away, huh? just like some children huh? get leukemia. Huh? Just as the clay pots made by the potter tend to end up being shattered. So it is with the life of mortals. Both the young and the old, whether they are foolish or wise, are going to be trapped by death. All beings move towards death. They are overcome by death. They go to the other world. And then not even a father can save his son or a family their relatives. Look, while relatives are watching, tearful and groaning, men are carried off one by one. A cattle being led to the slaughter. So death and aging are endemic to the world. Therefore the wise do not grieve seeing the nature of the world. You cannot know his path as to where he has come from or where he is going to. So it makes no sense to grieve for him. The man who grieves gains nothing. He is doing no more than a foolish man who is trying to hurt himself. If a wise man does it, it is the same for him. Peace of mind cannot come from weeping and wailing. On the contrary, it will lead to more suffering and greater pain. The mourner will become pale and thin. He is doing violence to himself, and still he cannot keep the dead alive. His mourning is pointless. The man who cannot leave his sorrow behind him only travels further into pain. His mourning makes him a slave to sorrow. Look at beings who are facing death, who are living out the results of their previous deeds. People are terrified when they see that they are trapped by death. What people expect to happen is always different from what actually happens. From this comes great disappointment. This is the way the world works. A man may live for a hundred years or even more, but in the end he is separated from his relatives, and he too leaves life in this world. So we can listen and learn from the noble man as he gives up his grief. When he sees that someone has passed away and lived out their life, he says, he will not be seen by me again. When the house is burning, the fire is put out by water. In the same way, the wise man, skillful, learned and self-reliant, extinguishes sorrow as soon as it arises in him. It is like the wind 
blowing away a tuft of cotton. The person who is searching for his own for his own happiness should pull out the dart that he has stuck in himself, the arrowhead of grieving, of desiring, of despair. The man who has taken out the dart, who has no clinging, who has obtained peace of mind, pass beyond all grief. This man, free from grief, is still. So this is a good uh, reminder to us. Lah. Life is such uh, that everyone has to die. But uh, even though we all know this, uh, we see it all around us. Uh, a lot of people don't want to accept it. Uh. So they don't want to accept it. They don't want to think about it. They don't want to prepare themselves uh, for the day uh, when they will die or their beloved ones will die. Uh. So when death comes, uh, uh, then uh, people will cry and grieve. Uh. But as this sutta says, uh, what's the point? You already know that this is going to happen, so you should expect it. Uh. And if you expect something, uh, uh, as the scouts say, uh, be, be prepared. Uh, so when you are prepared, uh, whatever comes, uh, uh, you won't grieve. Uh, but if you don't want to prepare yourself, when death comes, uh, uh, then you suffer, uh, you'll grieve. Uh, and we have seen people grieve at a funeral, uh, and you know uh, there's no grief. Uh, like the grief uh, that uh, you see at a funeral. Uh. Mm. Anything to discuss? When we sit down and meditate, uh, we are supposed to practice samatha, because uh, vipassana, samatha and vipassana is the eighth factor and the seventh factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. La. This uh, vipassana, contemplating body, feelings, mind and dhamma, you can do in any posture. Okay? But when you sit down to meditate uh, with your eyes closed, uh, you practice samatha, which means uh, you focus your attention uh, on only one object. Only one object and unremitting mindfulness on one object. So, for example, you are contemplating uh, your breath, la, mindfulness of your breath. So, the breath goes in and the breath goes out, in and out. You put your attention there. No? Uh, so, if your mind uh, is pulled by thoughts, uh, it runs away uh, from your object, uh, you must pull it back. Pulling your attention back to your object uh, is called vitaka. Okay? And then keeping it, keeping your attention, your mindfulness on your object, uh, your breath, uh, is called vichara. So these two things uh, are the most important uh, in your meditation, vitaka and vichara, thought directed and thought sustained. Okay, that means you are thinking of your breath all the time, lah. Uh, so each time your mindfulness runs away, you pull it back again to your breath, lah. That is thought directed, lah. Directed to your breath again, lah. Again it runs out. Again you direct it to your breath again, uh, And then keeping it on your breath, lah, is sustained. Thought sustained, uh, that is vichara. So, in our meditation, uh, in practicing samatha, you only use these two things. Uh. We keep using these two things. Uh. And if you practice uh, and the conditions are right, uh, then uh, you are able to stay with your breath. Uh. Okay? Your attention, you are able to stay with your breath. And if you are able to stay with your breath uh, uh, continuously, uh, then... Uh, the mind becomes one-pointed. Nah. At the same time, nah, delight will arise and bliss will arise. Nah. Delight means nah, you are delighted. Nah. Your mind is becoming one-pointed. Nah. Okay? And bliss, nah, you are experiencing a, a happiness nah, that you didn't know before. Nah. It's so nice, nah, so sweet. Nah. Uh, so at the same time, your mind becomes one-pointed. Nah. So these five things, nah, vitaka, vichara, uh, piti, which is delight, sukha, which is uh, bliss, 
and ekagata, which is one pointedness of mind. Uh, these five things uh, <clears throat> bring you into the first jhana. Bring you into the first jhana. Okay? But however, for some people, uh, the thoughts are extremely strong. Uh, okay? So you try to bring your attention uh, to your object of meditation, you're not able to uh, because the uh, stray thoughts are too strong. Uh. In which case, uh, uh, you have to uh, uh, use some trick. Uh, uh, and what is that? Uh, one way uh, is to imagine uh, your mind uh, is a big TV screen. Okay? The mind is a big TV screen and the thoughts are arising one after another. Unwanted thoughts, uh, stray thoughts uh, arising, uh, thoughts about your family, thoughts about your work uh, and all these things. Uh. Yeah. So you look at this screen uh, and you let the thoughts arise. Uh. As soon as any thought arises, uh, you push it away, you wait for the next thought. And then you arise again, you push it away, don't pay attention, wait for the next thought. As it arises, you push it away, wait for the next thought. As you keep doing this, uh, then uh, the thoughts will slowly s- slow down. Slow down. Because you are expecting it. Ma. So it slows down uh, until it stops. Uh. I'll give you a simile. Uh, just like if you didn't uh, notice, uh, suddenly you achu, you, you sneeze. Uh, and then you feel you are going to sneeze again. Uh, you, ex- you are expecting it. Uh, then you ah, ah, ah. But it doesn't sneeze. You don't sneeze uh, uh, because you are expecting it. Uh. But you don't expect it. Suddenly you sneeze. Uh. So in the same way, no? Uh, because you are waiting for your thoughts to, 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 to show up, uh, and then they, they start to feel shy, uh, and they slow down, slow down, slow down, until they stop. Uh, yeah? That's one way. One pointedness, uh, ekagata, means your attention is focused on one object uh, and only one object. Uh. So it takes training. Uh. You have to keep doing that. Uh. Uh, the mind uh, is not used to it, so it doesn't like that. Because for years, uh, for umpteen years, for many lifetimes, uh, you have allowed your mind uh, to be entertained by sights, by sounds, by smells, tastes and all that. Now you want to restrict it. It's like a, 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 a young kid. Nah. The kid has been used to going out, nah, playing and all that. Now you tell him nah, you cannot go out, you stay in your room. You think he likes that. Nah. He doesn't like that. So the same way, when you try to discipline your mind, nah, the mind is, it just won't accept it. It's so used to running out. Nah, he wants to keep running out through the six senses. Nah. Okay? Uh, so it needs a lot of discipline. You can consider it a feeling, you consider it... Uh, sukha is a feeling. Uh, delight, uh, I guess you can call it a feeling. Uh. It's an experience. Uh. Don't analyze like a uh, splitting hairs. Uh. Uh, there's no point in uh, in uh, splitting hairs. You're not going to get anything out of it. Uh. Okay? Mm. People have this tendency, uh, just like the scholars. Uh, you know, you go and read commentaries and all that. Uh, this is what they do. Uh. Every word of the Buddha, they will analyze and all these things. Or four. What you want to do is, you want to know what is the purpose. What is your purpose? Uh, your purpose is to practice and get that one pointedness. So you just practice like what the Buddha says, lah. To go and uh, analyze the Buddha's words one by one. As I explained just now, uh, one pointedness means your mind uh, is one pointed on one object. That's it. It's not running away, lah. It's just on one object.
or that is when the mind is very wild. This uh, uh, method, uh, uh, I, I said just now, uh, is to look at the source of the thoughts. Uh. So, when, uh, where it's coming from, okay, where your thoughts are coming from. So, when you look at it, uh, then a uh, thought will surface, uh, okay. Uh, and soon, as soon as it surfaces, uh, you push it aside, okay. And wait for the next one. Don't try to uh, don't try to follow the thought lah, or find out what it's about lah. Just know that it arises, eh? and push it aside and wait for the next one until na eh, it slows down. Okay. Then when it stops, eh, you don't stand still. When it stops, eh, you go back to your object, which is your breath, because eh, you must keep the mind. The mind wants to do some work all the time. Uh, you cannot uh, have an idle mind. You think, oh, now the stop, the mind, the thoughts stop already, uh, and then you can relax. No, you don't relax. You put your mind to work again on your object of meditation. Uh, you cannot relax one. An idle mind is a devil's workshop. Uh, so you can never let the mind be idle. The mind wants to to do. Is so used to working, uh, uh twenty four hours a day. Uh, seven days a week, uh, and not only 24 hours, uh, every second, uh, every, uh, every second or so, uh, I don't know how many times it is working. Uh, it's working non-stop. Uh. So, uh, the mind wants to work, so we let the mind work. But instead of uh, working at so many areas, uh, wanting to see, wanting to hear, wanting to smell, taste, touch and think, uh, we only let it do one job only. One job. You don't let it do so many jobs. Just one job. Uh, so as soon as the mind calms down, uh, you bring it back to the job you want it to do. La. For example, your breath. Uh, don't relax. Uh, you think, oh, so happy. Uh. <laughs> no thought already. Uh. Uh, you don't relax. What do you mean by point? It's not a point, it's a state of mind. We are talking about the breath itself becoming finer and finer, right? Hmm. Oh, no, no, no. You use your breath, eh, your object, eh, uh, in that way I just described, eh, to get into the first jhana. Okay? So after you get into the first jhana, you must perfect your first jhana. Okay? Then after you, your, jhana, your first jhana is strong, eh, then you shift your attention from the breath. Eh, you shift it to your piti and sukha. When you shift your attention to the piti and sukha, that means you enjoy your piti and sukha. Eh, you indulge in your piti and sukha. Because as you... As you strengthen your, your first jhana, it becomes stronger. Okay? 
then when you put your attention on pity and sukha, you are no more focused on the breath. You are no more focused on the breath, huh? then the vitaka and vichara falls away. Huh? Then you enter the second jhana. So the breath is only useful in the first jhana. Okay, shall we end here?